بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We begin today with a number of types of prayers and that is the prayer of istisqa and the prayer of eclipse and where we request Allah Azza wa Jal and supplicate to him so that he would provide us with rain and the format is exactly equivalent to the prayer of Eid with few differences here and there. So what is the most authentic opinion on praying Salatul Istisqa? The prayer where we ask Allah Azza wa Jal for rain. Again, this is an issue of dispute some said it is recommended sunnah whether you pray it or not there is no problem some said it is a communal duty or obligation fardun ala al kifaya and it seems most likely to be a sunnah muakkada a highly recommended Sunnah, not that it is mandatory, but rather it is a highly recommended Sunnah, as it was not not ever stressed upon the Muslims to offer it. And the prayer of istisqa is a manifestation to Allah Azza wa Jal when we get rid of all authorities we have and we declare that we have no knowledge and no power and no ability without Allah Azza wa Jal. The Sunnah is for people when they go to pray, the Sunnah is that they express their poverty by wearing modest clothes by walking to the prayer humbly by beseeching Allah Azza wa Jal and filling their hearts with true and sincere need to Allah Azza wa Jal and to continue throughout the prayer in urging Allah and this is problematic for a lot of us because we take most things for granted we ask Allah Azza wa Jal for things and we take it for granted um, give me a second just to fix it seems that the picture is not so clear Now I know why it's not clear. Okay. It was a technical error. Jazakumullahu uh, <laughs> khairan for notifying me. This is what happens when you have when a one-man show, literally a one-man show. Uh, but alhamdulillah, I'll deduct from the, from the director's salary for this uh, uh, mistake or the cameraman. Or the sound man who cares anyhow so when you go to istisqa you actually go with a lot of humility in you this humility we fail to recognize because a lot of the time we take take Allah's gifts to us for granted so ask anyone around you 
it hasn't rained for like a couple of years. He would shrug his shoulders and say, who cares? I Every single day I turn on the faucet and alhamdulillah there's tap water. I can shower anytime. I can have a bath anytime. We're never thirsty. We fail to recognize that this is a gift from Allah Azza wa Jal because we have desalination plants. We have wells, we have rivers, not knowing that it is life. So this is life that Allah Azza wa Jal has. And if people do not beg him, we have seen what drought and famine does or do in African countries, in places that were severely hit by it and caused deaths and fatalities. So we need this. It's not something that a man-made cloud would succeed in getting you what you want. It's in Allah's hand and only in Allah's hand. So what is the format of Salatul Istisqa? It is like Eid prayer. The Imam, as described earlier, takes the people to an open area like Eid, same time as Eid, and he offers two rak'ahs with seven takbirs in the beginning, in the first rak'ah, and five takbirs in the second rak'ah. So he says, Allahu Akbar takbiratul ihram. He recites dua or istiftah. Subhanakallah, muhammadi tabarak, asmuk ta'ala jadduk wa la And then he offers seven times in one school of thought and in another school of thought, six times. And the most authentic opinion singled out as a number without adding to it takbiratul ihram. And in the second rak'ah, he does this five times, and we did not say four times because they did not add to it takbiratul movement, the movement from sujood to standing up. Otherwise, they would have said six. So he does seven times, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, after each time he places his hand in the second rak'ah, he does the same format, but five takbirs instead of seven, and he says Surah al ghashiya and then he concludes his prayer, and then he gives one khutbah. Some schools of thought say that he gives two khutbah, exactly as, in, as they had said in Eid prayer, that it is composed of two khutbahs, and this is not the most authentic opinion. The most authentic opinion is that it is only one single khutbah. As you remember, the Prophet did not والسلام, have his mimbar taking, taken out to the public. So it wasn't taken with him and hence he did not have a place to sit down. So he only delivered one khutbah. Some scholars say that the second khutbah was the khutbah of the women. But this was not part of the Eid. It was either something that was random or done once, or it was a separate way of addressing women because of their distance uh, from the Musalla. Then he delivers a khutbah. And in this khutbah, he reminds the people to repent to Allah. He glorifies Allah Azza wa Jal. He expresses the need of the people and their begging to Allah Azza wa Jal to grant them the rain that they need to sustain their lives. He to ask Allah for forgiveness, to mend their ways and to fix their lifestyles. So it's a reminder and also to give people hope. Yes, we are begging Allah Azza wa Jal and we are seeking Allah's forgiveness and Allah's favors and blessing. But at the same time, we are optimistic and we believe that and you see someone going out with an umbrella because he's confident that 
Allah will make it rain. And at the end of the sermon, while making dua, it is sunnah if you are wearing an outer garment, a cloak, a hoodie, a jacket, something that is usually worn, not this thob, something extra. Sometimes we wear it in black, sometimes it's in beige. And it's part of the sunnah to turn it upside down. So I take it off and I put the right shoulder on my, over my left and the left shoulder over my right. So I twist it and I wear it uh, upside down because the Prophet did this alayhi salatu wasalam, and he did this as a token of good omen. So he's doing this as to indicate that, oh Allah, we believe that you alone can change things and we're changing our outer garment accordingly being optimistic that you will change the drought we're in and that it will rain. So this is the sunnah to do it only at the end of the khutbah as the imam does it. Is it for the imam and everybody else or only for him? No, it's for everybody else as well. Because the prophet would not do something and the companions just watch. They would de definitely and immediately uh, uh, follow suit as in the time when he prayed with his shoes on and he took it in the middle of the prayer because Jibreel peace be upon him told him that there was najasa on it so it's the same way the same thing the same concept uh, uh, that the companions are raised to do and that is to follow whatever the prophet does alayhi salatu wassalam now is this the only way to ask Allah for rain? The answer is no. Salat, where the Muslims gather at a specific place to pray a specific prayer. So this is one way of doing it. The second way of asking Allah for rain is during Khutbatul Jumu'ah. And this is in the Sahih Hadith, where the Prophet Anas ibn Malik عنه, says that the Prophet was given once a Friday sermon when all of a sudden a man from the nomad from the Bedouins said O Prophet of Allah the is dying and the crops are drying out ask Allah Azza wa Jal to send rain for us so on the spot while giving the khutbah the Prophet raised his hands and this is the only place where you raise your hands in a Friday khutbah. Because unlike what most Muslims believe that when making dua in khutbah, you have to raise your hands or it is highly recommended. It is not. Neither for the Imam nor for the congregation. During khutbah to Jum'ah, none of the companions used to ever raise their hands. This is an innovation except when the Imam makes dua for rain. So the Prophet raised his hands, started asking Allah Azza wa for rain. So did the companions saying, Ameen. And all of a sudden, in a clear sky, and before long, the whole sky was filled with clouds. And immediately it started pouring they say dogs and cats, but alhamdulillah, it, it wasn't that. It was raining, real rain. And it continued to rain for a whole week. Until the following Friday, when the Prophet was giving the Salat Wasam, the same man, maybe someone else, Anas Doubts. Is it the same man who came last week or someone else? And stood at the gates of the masjid saying, Oh Prophet of Allah, the land has drowned and the floods have overwhelmed us and the houses are destroyed because of this rain ask Allah to stop it so the Prophet started saying Allahumma hawalayna wa la alayna oh Allah let it rain around us not on us and without any hesitation the rain stopped and it was clear skies 
afterwards. So this is the second type of asking Allah for rain. When doing it with the Imam on a Friday. The third type is to ask Allah for rain individually. So I'm praying night prayer, I'm praying duha, I'm praying voluntary prayers. And in my sujood or, or before salam, in, after my tashahud, I supplicate to Allah Azza wa for seven throughout the whole year. You have no problem in that. You're doing it individually and you're asking Allah for it and no problem in that. Now, um, what happens if a person missed this salat? So is it permissible that he does it alone or not? Scholars say that this was not reported in the sunnah. But there's, there, not, there seems nothing wrong in doing it. So if a person does it alone in his home, with the same format, there's no problem in doing it, but it's not from the sunnah. It is a prayer that a person supplicates to Allah and asks Allah Azzawajal for dua. And what is the time for Salatul Istisqa? Some say it's exactly the day that you can pray it in the evening, in the morning, in the afternoon. And it seems that the doing of the Prophet was to pray it after the sun rises. And uh, uh, this is the time of Eid and Allah Azzawajal knows best. Now we move to the prayer of the eclipse. The prayer of the eclipse is a prayer expressing your fear from Allah Azza wa and your glorification to Him. And in Arabic, as Shams, the sun, we have the eclipse prayer called Al Kusuf, Salatul Kusuf. And for the moon, we say Salatul Khusuf. And one is feminine and one is masculine. And this is why it's different in wording, but it's the same format. It's just the eclipse prayer. Now, why do we pray such a prayer? The Prophet himself, alayhi salatu wasalam, when the sun eclipsed one day, and this coincided with the death of his youngest son, Ibrahim, the son of the Coptic Maria. And he was six months, one year, two years old, and this is the most likelihood. So when he died, the Prophet والسلام, was saddened greatly by this. Because we know that the Prophet Sallallahu male children all died young. To the extent that the idol worshippers used to mock and laugh from the Prophet Sallallahu by saying that he was abtar, mind and carry his name. And Allah Azza wa Jal, of course, um, replied to that where Allah Azza wa Jal said, Inna shani aka. So this means that the Prophet was saddened like any other man. Give me a second. Let me do this. Okay. This was a mistake. I think I rotated the YouTube camera wrong again this is another day to deduct from the cameraman's uh, salary anyhow so the Prophet والسلام, was saddened by this and all of a sudden the Sun eclipsed so the companions started saying oh it eclipsed because the son of the Prophet ﷺ, that is with an O, died. So the Prophet ﷺ ordered them to come to pray in the masjid. And this is 
is a prayer that has a specific call to it. So he ordered Bilal to announce a salah to jamia, a salah to jamia, which means that the prayer calls everyone to the congregation. So they all came and the Prophet ﷺ led them in prayer and then he explained to them invalid. The sun and the moon are two great signs of Allah Azza wa Jal that do not eclipse for the death or the life of any person. Now, the Prophet also said that these are two great signs that Allah intimidates people with. And the vast majority of Muslims nowadays would say, yeah, eclipses, this causes the moon to lose its light. Or it's the moon coming between the earth and the sun, which causes the sun to lose its light. So it's, it's, it's uh, something predictable. We know that an eclipse is going to happen on day so and so, month so and so, at the hour and the minute of so and so. So what's so special about it? Subhanallah. Look how shaitan utilizes science that was only taught to us by Allah Azza wa Jal. The science we did not come up with. Allah says in the Quran, Wallahu akhrajakum min butuni ummaha la lakum sam'a wal abusara wal afida la alakum tashkurun. It is Allah Azza wa Jal that who extracted you, got you out of your mother's wombs, knowing nothing. And he gave you hearing, sight, and the ability to think so that you may thank him and express your gratitude to him. Yet now with this science, instead of believing in Allah Azza wa Jal, we commit kufr and disbelief in Allah's great ability, subhanahu wa ta'ala. The moon and the sun are signs of Allah Azza wa Jal. And when the eclipse takes place, Allah is throwing and casting fear in our hearts that look at these great and huge creations of Allah Azza wa Jal that you may not imagine living without. Look what I can do to them in moments. And one would say, okay, then what about the scientist predicting it. It's not a prediction. Allah's signs, Allah's creation run like clockwork. This is something that Allah has created and he had set such perfection. There's nothing magical about it that people know when it's going to happen because it's Allah who is making it happen. It's Allah who's revealing to us how and when it will take place. So it is something that calls people to be afraid of Allah Azza wa Jal. And this is why the Prophet, whenever the eclipse took place, he would be frightened and he would immediately start to pray in a special prayer, a format that is shared by no other prayer in our religion because it's something that is of great importance. So what's the ruling on praying this prayer? Is it a must or is it a sunnah mu'akkada like the istisqa? It's an, an issue of dispute among scholars. The most authentic opinion is that it is a communal abri male Muslim. The least we can say it's a communal obligation and duty. Fard an al kifaya. But if you say that it is mandatory, you wouldn't be too wrong. Because the many hadiths that the Prophet ordered the men and ordered the people to come and pray indicates that this is not something to be taken lightly. 
So uh, um, how to perform it? It should be performed in congregation, in the masjid, and when to begin praying it and when to end, it has to be visible. The eclipse has to be visible. So many times we hear in the media that at 9.45 p.m. the moon will have an eclipse. And the people go to the masjid and pray, which is totally wrong. It, it, in this case, yes, you can pray. We don't have to all of us see it at the same time. It's sufficient that the imam or two or three people who had seen it begin, we uh, begin the prayer. When does the prayer end? It should end when the eclipse is over. So this is something that you try to estimate because you don't know whether it's going to take five minutes, 10 minutes, half an hour or a whole hour or maybe more. So you try to do your level best and prolong the prayer. Now the prayer itself is usual. It's a prayer with two units like Fajr. But Fajr prayer has two units with two Ruku'ah and four prostrations. Every two units in Islam has the same format. Each, each unit has one Ruku'ah and two prostrations. So the total is two Ruku'ah and two bowing and four prostrations. Every prayer has this format but not the prayer of the eclipse the prayer of the eclipse has two units where each unit has two record two bowing and two prostrations whoa this is awkward yeah it is awkward it's a weird nothing in islam resembles this format because it is prayed and performed when these great signs of Allah take place. So how is it prayed? The Imam tells the Mu'adhin to call for prayer. As-salatu jami'ah, as-salatu jami'ah. Once the people come and gather, du'a ul istiftah, the Urdu people I think call it sana, and then a'udhu billahi shtar rajim bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim al-fatiha. After the fatiha, he recites a long surah and he has to estimate. So maybe he would recite or pray for an hour. Then he would most likely recite a long surah uh, uh, of the Quran that would fit. After he finishes, he says, Allahu Akbar, he bows down in rukur. And he prolongs the rukur a lot because this is a prayer of submission this is a prayer of expressing your fear from Allah Azza it is not something you want to pray in like a couple of minutes and go back watch your football match it is something that clearly expresses that I am out of my daily routine I'm here surrendering my humility my poverty my need and my fear of you, O Almighty Allah. After a long bowing, he says, Sami Allahu liman hamida. And then he, he starts reciting the Fatiha again. This is his second upcoming from the Rukur. And he recites also a Surah afterwards, shorter than the first one, relatively speaking. Then he goes for rukur, Allahu Akbar, and he prolongs his rukur, a bit shorter than the one before. Then he says, Sami Allahu liman hamida. Then he says, Allahu Akbar, and falls and prostrates twice, like normal prayers. Then he says, Allahu Akbar afterwards and stands up for the second rak'ah, the second unit, rukur. Rises, rises up from Rukur, Sami Allah liman hamida, and also reciting the Fatiha for the fourth time and a Surah 
that is shorter than the previous ones and then offers rukur and continues to the rest of the prayer as usual two units four bowing positions four rukur and four sujood four times reciting the fatiha on four different surahs scholars differ whether he should give a sermon or it is not a sermon but a reminder either way he has to give a sort of a speech one speech where he focuses on repentance asking Allah for forgiveness expressing our poverty and humility to Allah reminding people of our need to Allah Azza wa Jal and how great and powerful Allah is we think in limited ways now remember Abu Sa'id al-Khudri may Allah be pleased with him was with the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam once when the Prophet showed and pointed out the sun while it was setting so it's Maghrib time almost so the Prophet said to Abu Sa'id do you know where the sun is headed to Abu Sa'id said no I have no knowledge of that so the Prophet says that the sun is prostrating at Allah's throne asking Allah's permission to rise again and it rises when Allah, and we know that there will come a time when Allah does not give it the permission to rise from the east and it rises from the west and this is one of the ten signs of the day of judgment now one due to our limited knowledge would say come on man what do you mean that the sun sets prostrating at the throne of Allah Azza wa Jal, seeking permission when the sun sets here it rises somewhere else and when it rises somewhere where else it sets somewhere else well come on give me a break it to give you when you speak about something that is way above your pay grade now if I ask you what are the dimensions that govern our world you would say it's the height the width and the length so these are three dimensions and recently they've added the dimension of time and the relativity theory of Einstein and uh, how valid it is or not and going forth and, and back so these are the three dimensions the four dimensions that we can relate to but this does not apply to the world of the unseen things happen in the grave in different dimensions than our own in this three or two foot by six or whatever in this hole we know for sure that the dead person is made to sit and two angels come and interrogate him and either punish him or reward him we know that this grave is expanded it can be filled with light from Jannah a window to paradise is opened all this happens in this small area by which dimensions are we talking about definitely not ours the Prophet on the night journey alayhi salatu wasalam, the buraq the ride he took it travels faster than light and it's faster not equivalent so we can even imagine it goes and passes by the grave of Musa near the red dome or the red uh, um, dune that is where he's buried and the Prophet said I saw him praying there and in a flash they are 
at Al-Aqsa Masjid in Jerusalem. And he, the Prophet, sees him there and he leads him in prayer as he leads the rest of the Prophets and Messengers of Allah who were summoned there through dimensions we don't understand. Then in a flash he reaches the fourth heaven and he meets Musa again. So what dimensions are we talking about? Something that does not relate to this world. Therefore, when you hear things of the unseen, whether the sun is prostrating to the throne of Allah, to Allah Azza wa at the throne or not, you do not think of that of your own, by your own intellect, with your own standards, which is height, width, and length. Where are the jinn? Where are the angels? How they travel, how they live, how they exist? This is something that does not fall under our calculations. So we have to always think of how great Allah Azza wa Jal is and devote our forms of worship, our ibadah, sincerely only to Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And while doing this, we Allah Azza wa knows best. Uh, I think we it's time to move on to questions. I have questions from last week. Um, number 15. Sharman says, If a person dies, is it permissible to keep the body in a freezer and wait for the children of the deceased three to four days and do the, and do the burial uh, later? This is not according to the sunnah of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. The Prophet told us Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that honoring the deceased is to bury him. And it's one of two. Either the deceased is going to Jannah, which means that every hour you keep him away from being buried, you're delaying him going to Jannah. Or he's going to hellfire May Allah protect us all and every minute you keep him among you, you're actually being harmed by such bad company. Therefore, keeping your father in a freezer for three, four days is not something that is at all recommended. If it is, if it's a day, for example, or half a day, and uh, let's say he died in the Fajr time and the sun is coming through a plane it takes to reach. Yeah, this is applicable. This is possible. But to put him in a freezer to three or four days, this is not uh, uh, something advisable because it is not of great importance that the children see their father for the last time, as they say. We don't have this concept in Islam that justifies such a delay in burial. Ali Sheikh, that would hit some of my uh, my uh, obligatory prayers, which would lead me to skip it because I do not have a break time for that. This is not uh, something that I can relate to because even if you work for an eight hour or nine hour shift, when a man has to go, a man has to go. So people who are diabetic, they, has, they have to go to the toilet every two hours on average. So you don't mean to tell me that they won't allow you to go for uh, the toilet? This is not something applicable. In an eight hour or nine hour shift, you need to take a coffee break this is it goes without saying so you have to improvise and simply just go and pray outside of the room or the hall not necessarily at the masjid but you have to pray on time if you can pray and divide the work among you in such a way that you can do that that would be a win-win situation if not then I think it's time for you to look for another job because a job that demands that you sit for nine hours 
without being able to go to the toilet or to have a coffee break, let alone pray, then definitely this is not the right place for you to be and Allah knows best. Zaid Zubair says, if I'm behind the Imam and I forget something in prayer, I, uh, is it also mandatory for me to perform the sujood of Sahu? Uh, thank you. First of all, uh, Zaid, if you recall that when we spoke about prayer, we said that there are pillars, mandatory acts, and there are sunnah acts, voluntary acts. When it, deliberately or not, this doesn't matter. So raising your hands, saying Allahu Akbar. If you don't want to raise your hands, no problem. Your prayer is valid. When it comes to mandatory acts, such as saying Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la in sujood, Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim in ruku', the first tashahud in a three or four rak'ah prayer, uh, etc. These are mandatory acts. If you forget them, then the Imam carries them for you. So if I started praying with the Jude, I forgot to say Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la. I said, At-Tahiyyatu Lillahi wa Salawatu wa Tayyibat Assalamu Alaika Ayyuhah Nabiyu. What is this? I forgot. I got confused. I got distracted. And the Imam says, Allahu Akbar. And he sits. And then I realized what I had done. There is no sujood as sahu. There is no prostration of forgetfulness for this because the Imam carries your mistake. But if you forgot something that is a pillar, now this is a different story. So, for example, the Imam is praying dhuhr. And in the first rak'ah, you forgot to pray or to recite the Fatiha. Now, the Fatiha is a pillar. So, you went for the second rak'ah, third rak'ah, fourth rak'ah, and you remembered that you did not offer or did not recite the Fatiha. What happens now? In this case, the rak'ah that you've forfeited, you forgot, you dropped, this pillar is void. And the second, third, fourth rak'ah you did with the Imam are considered your first, second, third. Once he gives salam, you stand up and you pray the missing rak'ah and you offer sujood of prostration uh, before the salam or after the salam. Not the last one. The last one is your fourth rak'ah and you had to offer it. So I hope this answers your question. Why did, uh, this is from Fazlur Rahman. Why did the Prophet والسلام, forbade us from fasting on a Friday? What do you think the hikmah behind it is? Friday is our weekly Eid. And the consensus of all scholars that fasting on the Eid of Al-Adha or the Eid of Al-Fitr is totally invalid. If you do it, it's invalid. So the scholars said that Friday is our weekly Eid and hence it should not be dedicated with fasting it alone or offering night prayer on it night alone. If you want to fast Friday, it has to be accompanied by Thursday prior to it or Saturday after it in general terms. There are some specific cases, but this is not the time to go through it. And Allah Azza knows best. Aladdin Hamzik. What is the ruling on working in a supermarket with khamr, with intoxicants, if one is in need of money? If you are working in a department that does not deal or handle or cash or take money, anything that is haram, it's okay. So if you're in a supermarket and they sell intoxicants, they sell uh, pork, haram meat, but you work at the vegetable section or you work at the electronics section, you have nothing to do with handling such haram material or selling it, or you're not a cashier, you're not a porter, or a more decent place to work for. 
Then the questions of last lecture. One, Haslin says, will it be a valid reason to break the Salah if I hear the water spilling over the tank and I need to switch off the button in order to stop the motor? The answer is yes. This is a legitimate reason because if you continue to pray, the water will be spilled and it will um, be a waste of wealth and annoyance to your neighbors. So this is a legitimate reason, inshallah. Bansi Timbi says, I want to understand the hadith that the Prophet ﷺ said his ummah will be like the prophets of the Jews. Correct me if I misquoted the hadith. I do not know which hadith you're talking about, uh, Bensi. Uh, apologies. <clears throat> the second que question from Bensi. Uh, my question is about the Sermon of Jum'ah ah and Eid. The imams of my local area reads from an old booklet in Arabic, which majority of the people do not understand. Is this practice permissible? The answer is no. It's an issue of dispute, though the majority of scholars say that the khutbah should be in Arabic. A great number of scholars say that it should be in the language of the community. What is the purpose of khutbah al Jumu'ah? It's a one week uh, or it's once a week sermon where the congregation come to hear something in 10 to 15 minutes that would benefit them and recharge them for the next week till the next week. So if you do it in Arabic where nowhere in Islam it says that the reminders, the lectures should be in Arabic when you do it in Arabic, you deprive the congregation from benefiting. I remember a few years back, I prayed in Delhi and not New Delhi, the old Delhi. Jum'a prayer. And he said, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And the adhan was given. So I was there in the first row. And he started giving khutbah, reading it from a booklet. It was in Arabic. I'm an Arab, I'm a native. I could not understand any of his words except Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, blah, 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 blah. Is this Arabic? <clears throat> it sounded Arabic, but I could not make out what he wanted. And all the Indians around me are either yawning or dozing nobody understands what he's saying so after like 20 25 minutes the sermon was over we did the salat we came out of the masjid the only one who understood what went on was the imam himself because he had the book in his hand so this is definitely not why allah azza wa jal ordered us to pray juma so if I go to the UK, I deliver my speech in English. I will commence it, I'll begin it with Inna alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inu wa nasta'afiru. I will say the three ayat that the Prophet used to recite. And then I will say the rest of the sermon of al khutbah khutbah al haja And I'll begin in English. First, khutbah, uh, first sermon, the second sermon. And I'll conclude with dua in Arabic. Simply because I don't know how to make dua in English. It's not my native language. So this is how it should be done. And I've been advocating this throughout my life. Because so many people go against it. They said, no, khutbah has to be in Arabic. Akhi, if it's in Arabic, nobody understands. So said, no, no, no. That's why we make bayan before the khutbah. Said, but this is not part of the sunnah to make bayan. Why should you make circles before the uh, uh, Jum'ah itself. So I hope this answers your question. And finish the remaining rak'at. I've explained this a little bit earlier and I said that whatever you pray with your Imam, so if you missed two rak'ahs of Dhuhr, you will pray with the Imam his third and fourth rak'ah. But this is your first and second rak'ah. 
So after he offers salam, you stand up to pray your third and fourth rak'ah. If you missed all three rak'ahs and you only prayed the fourth with him, this is your fourth. After salam, you stand up and pray the second rak'ah. You sit down for tashahud. You stand up, you pray third and fourth rak'ah to the end. Fida says, what is the ruling on making wudu with water that was recycled? Originally, the water was sewage, but was recycled and fed back into the system pipeline. There is a fatwa of the Fiqhi Council, if I recall, reading it maybe 10, 15 years ago, and they said that there are three types of uh, recycling. It's okay. I think for um, the first is is okay to irrigate with the second is okay to um, I don't know what the third type of recycling which is the highest level is permissible to use for uh, wudu but they do not advise that you drink it so the th the third level of recycling, this takes out any smell, color, or taste of the water. So it is transformed totally to water. And the action or the process of transformation in Islam is valid and found. So, for example, a, an animal. No one says that, oh, what are you doing? This is transformed to a different and new uh, uh, material or subject. And likewise, with recycled or desalinated water that loses all characteristics of impurity, you can use that for wudu, inshallah, and Allah knows best. Um, Haslin says, Haslin Fatima, you said it is sunnah to eat liver or meat from the sacrifice after the Eid prayer. This sunnah is applicable for the one who is giving the sacrifice or all the family, no, all the whole family. If the whole family can wait, then this is highly recommended. Mirvat says, are women obligated to pray funeral prayer and do they get the same reward? It's not obligatory, as we have said, it's a communal duty. So if one does it, the whole can offers it, she will be rewarded with a carrot, which is equivalent to the Mount of Mount Uhud in good deeds. But is she obliged to do it? No, she can do it if she wants to in her home, in the masjid without any problem. Muti'a Lola, can burying a deceased be delayed for some time on the condition that one wants to wait for the children? I think we've gone through that. Humayra says, um, if someone took a loan on in buying or construction of a house, upon realization, what should he do? Should he sell this house and give the percentage of that amount to charity? The answer is no. The house is yours. The sin was in acquiring the loan. But you paid the loan, which is the capital plus the interest, from your own savings and earnings. So it is all halal for you. And Naeem says, he wants to know, is it permissible to rent my wedding hall with other religions, for example, Hindus or Christians to do wedding ceremonies? The answer is no. You cannot assist other religions on their weddings or their funerals, as the scholars say, especially when you know that in their weddings will be shirk or kufr, in addition to music and free mixing and liquor and haram stuff. So definitely this is not a good thing to do. Uh, Hadija says, are, are we allowed to make dua in our mother tongue when we are in sujood during the prayer, the answer is yes. You can do that, providing you do not know how to say it in Arabic. So in, in my sujood, I want to say, oh Allah, forgive me. 
Can I say, oh Allah, forgive me, or should I say, Rabbi Ghfirli? No, if you know how to say Rabbi Ghfirli, you have to say it in Arabic. But if you want to ask Allah Azza wa Jal to pay off your debts or to guide your children to becoming Imams, or saying it in your mother tongue. Muna says, the re, does the reward of funeral prayer in the Haramain, as Sharifain, that is the two holy mosques, is praying the funeral prayer equals according to other prayers offered in other places? She is referring to the hadith that a prayer in the Masjid al Haram of Mecca is equivalent to a hundred thousand prayers elsewhere. So, does this include all types of prayer, including? The funeral prayer, the answer is yes. Isra says, if someone does not have 14 or more people to attend the funeral prayer, I think, Isra, that you misquoted what I said. I said 40, not 14, 40. In the beginning, it was 100 person praying, funeral prayer, they will intercede. Allah reduced the number into 40. So whomever 40 people pray funeral prayer, uh, they intercede. It seems that they won't because the hadith is uh, clear in that they have to be 40. And the final, I think, question um, from Shahab says, is it necessary to make even number of rows people in the subcontinent do, uh, does it often? No. Um, if you're talking about normal rows in the masjid there is no preference whether it's odd or not or even so g leaving a gap in the row uh, in front of you or in some rows so that you would make even uh, a number of rows this is not part of the sunnah at all it's an innovation and finally muhammad nawfal says can I combine prayer due to my big, uh, due to my job? For example, Dhuhr and Asr, while Dhuhr prayer, where don't get time while uh, Asr. And I stated before that you must have a break for going to the toilet or to uh, have a coffee break. Some people go for a smoke. So definitely you can pray on time during that break. And Allah knows best until we meet next Thursday, I'll leave you fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.